University and welcome to this, the last Cog Talk of the season. We will be having Cog Talk starting again in October and if anyone has any ideas about topics that they want us to focus on, please come and talk to me afterwards and we'll see what we can do to accommodate you. This evening's session is on deep brain stimulation. If you bump your head, you sometimes see stars. If you've had the misfortune to bump it very hard, you will see stars. And the reason you see stars is because you have stimulated the nerves in your brain. Recently there was a report in the newspaper that if you stimulate the front of your brain with electricity, it would be better in examinations. I think it's a little bit late for our students who have just finished their exams, otherwise I'm sure they'd have all connected batteries to their skulls and seen if just they could squeeze another mark or two. Well, to help us understand this topic this evening, we have two eminent speakers. On your right, we have Professor Stephen Hall, and on your left, we have Dr. George O'Gallis, who is reader of psychology in Plymouth University. Stephen has joined us recently, so he's also in the School of Psychology. So we have two of our own homegrown psychologists, well, homegrown in the sense the students now want us, um, to tell you about it this evening. So I'm going to start by asking Giorgio to explain exactly what brain stimulation is, how it works, and how it can be used. Giorgio. Thank you, Michael, and I hope you can um, all hear me. Okay, if you are into science fiction, you'll have no trouble recognizing this book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip Dick. And this book is about the fine line between artificial entities such as androids and biological entities such as humans. And by the way, uh, the movie Blade Runner actually was based on this novel. Now, the reason I bring this up is that at the beginning of this novel there is a description of a very intriguing wireless device called the Penfield Mood Organ. And the Penfield Mood Organ looks a little bit like this. There are a bunch of dials in the front, there is some mysterious, mysterious circuitry inside, and there are these kind of uh, Penfield wave transmitters on the top that look like the, the, the pipes of an organ, that's why it's called the Mood Organ. Okay? And it works like this. If you uh, set the dials to a certain combination of values, the pentatonic transmitters generate some sort of wave that stimulates some part of your brain and it induces some kind of mood that you actually set on the dials. Okay? So, for example, if you end up a day at work, your boss is a jerk, when you go home you may want to dial 420 and you feel you'll be in a creative and fresh attitude towards your job. Okay? And there are many other settings that you can actually set in this uh, device, some of them more interesting than others, for example. So this one is actually an example from science fiction of a brain stimulating device that can actually manipulate our thoughts and our moods. Okay? This, is, uh, this, this novel was written in 1968, okay? and the story unfolds in the year 2021, so a few years from now. Okay? However, if you, uh, if you look at some of the headlines, recent headlines in the media, right, you might think actually that this kind of device is already a reality. For example, this last one, the electric picking cup that makes you clever and happy. Okay? So it looks like we got this device. Okay? So over the next 15 minutes, I'd like to actually tell you a little bit more about uh, what non-invasive brain stimulation is and how it works. Let's start with how it works. There are basically two ways of, of doing brain stimulation. The first one is through electromagnets, and it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. And the key principle is very simple. It's based on the principle of uh, electromagnetic induction. If we pass a current through this magnetic coil here, to this TMS coil, it generates a magnetic field, which in turn generates a secondary current in uh, nearby conductor loops, in this case, the neurons in your brain, okay? And so basically, if I give you um, a pulse that is strong enough, I can actually get some of the neurons to fire, okay? Remember, the neurons talk to each other by sending packets of information, which are actual potentials, okay? That's why, uh, if I actually stimulate your visual cortex back here, right, you can actually see some flashes of light, 
if I stimulate your visual cortex, your motor cortex up here, I can actually have, can actually have your finger to move. This is a non-invasive technique in the sense that we don't have to cut your hand open, okay? It all happens from the outside. And also, it's, uh, it has focal effects in the sense that the maximum of the effects is actually it's a, in a pretty small region of the brain, so you can target different regions. This is how it works, and actually Steven is going to give us a demonstration afterwards. You can see this figure of a coil, which we hold against the, the head of the subject. And typically we also have MRI data from each subject that we can display with some special equipment on this screen down there, because we want to know exactly where to stimulate. Okay. The second way of, of uh, doing brain stimulation is actually even simpler and it requires uh, basically injecting currents di directly into the subject's head okay? and it's called transcranial electrical stimulation This is the basic idea, as you can see it's very simple, right? It's just a 9-volt battery here, okay? connected to the, head of, to, the, to the head of this person In reality you also need some other circuitry here to keep the current constant and to limit it but that's the basic idea, okay? to inject with uh, really weak electrical currents into the head of the subject. Now, it turns out that the way this works, really, is by altering the fine probability of neurons, okay? So if you have neurons that are close to the end <coughs> of the positive pole of the battery, the neurons are going to be firing a little bit uh, more, it's going to be more easier for them to find. If they're actually closer to the uh, cathode, the negative pole, actually it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them to find, okay? And um, again, uh, it's a non-invasive technique, but this does not mean that you should, should just now go home and try doing that because you can actually hurt yourself if you actually don't uh, control the size of the electrons and the intensity, the duration of the, of, of the current. You can actually damage your skin, okay? All right, why is it used? There are two main classes of, of, of uses. The first one is basic science, and it's basically trying to understand how the brain works, okay? The second one is applications. So trying to do something with these techniques, can we do something, for example, treat some neuropsychiatric disorders or augment our cognitive capabilities? Let me just say a couple of things about the basic science part, which is actually very important for, for scientists like Dr. myself and Stephen, right? And the main point of brain stimulation in this context is really to provide evidence for causal links between brain activity and behavior. So what does this mean? Let's say that we want to see uh, which, which brain areas respond more to moving stimuli versus stationary stimuli. We can do a brain imaging experiment, such as this one, and find out that some regions, such as this one in the back of the head, right, uh, respond more to moving stimuli than to stationary stimuli. Okay? That's the standard brain imaging. However, we don't know for sure whether these areas, or whether all of these areas, are actually uh, necessary for the task. Okay? It's possible that some of these activations are actually not necessary for performing the task. Okay? So the only way to find out, really, there are two ways. One of them is to study patients who have damage in this area and see if they can do motion perception or not. But that's really complicated, and there are all sorts of drawbacks. The other way is to use brain stimulation. Okay? So we can um, stimulate these regions one at a time, perhaps, and, and look at the effects on behavior, okay? In this case, motion perception. Of course, we always have to compare uh, this stimulation condition to some control condition. I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm just going to tell you that it's called typically a sham condition, which involves basically no stimulation. It's a control condition, okay? And we can do all sorts of manipulations by varying the timing of the stimulation and uh, the, the magnitude and all that. I'm not going to go into these details. The second big, big field, really, is application, as I said, right? And there have been many attempts to try to uh, treat conditions such as depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, and, and so on, right? And also, uh, the second uh, big subfield here is uh, neurocognitive augmentation. This means trying to improve the cognitive abilities of normal people, okay? People who don't have a deficit. And there have been a number of reports um, about uh, improving language, learning memory, visual attention, and so on. We're going to talk about a couple of them. Alright, but we're going to major depression, right? Um, even, Kirsch, even, even Kirsch talked a little bit um, a, while, a while back about the drawbacks of drugs for treating depression, so it would be very nice if brain stimulation was actually a nice uh, way, a, 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 a new treatment for this condition. If you look at headlines such as this one, 
uh, we are tempted to infer that actually electric stimulation is really good and uh, we can treat depression, okay? Now, the reality is a little bit, uh, uh, is not as, um, as good, really. I just want to show you a couple of things. And uh, when people look at uh, the few studies that have um, investigated electric stimulation for treating depression, major depression, the results are really uh, very weak, okay? Small effect size on average. And this just gives an idea of how they, they look like. Remember that the zero here is uh, the line of no effect at all. These are eight different studies trying to see the effects of electric stimulation on major depressions, on the symptom of, of major depression. And as you can see, most of them are very close to the zero line with a couple of outliers that show a very big effect, but these are, are very small studies. Okay. So overall, the results of this field are really uh, kind of uh, not earth shattering. So the, the basic idea here is that uh, we don't have enough studies to look at this and we need many more studies and also bigger clinical trials, okay? Now, if we can try to uh, actually treat some neuro neuropsychiatric disorders, right, we can also try to actually enhance cognitive abilities in people who don't have any disorder, right, people who don't have any deficits. And that's the field of cognitive augmentation. Now, one particular area that I'm very interested in, because we are at a university, an educational, um, there's an educational mission here, right? Is basically the idea that we might be able to tweak, essentially, um, we may be able to tweak plasticity, neuroplasticity, to improve learning. Okay? And that's what this, this uh, headline is about. Amping up brain function, transparency simulation shows promise in speeding up learning. Now, of course, when you talk about speeding up learning, the military is always very interested because they, they want to be able to train the soldiers faster, okay? And that's why, actually, some of these studies, some of the best studies, I think, in the field so far, they have been funded by the U.S. military, it happens. So just to give you an example of how this works, in one of these studies, uh, a bunch of participants were given scenes that just these ones, okay? And they were asked simply to decide whether there, there is a threat or not in this scene, okay? So imagine this one uh, has been a war scene, okay, and I ask you, is there a threat in this scene? What do you think? How many of you think there is a threat? In it? Okay, a few. Can you see it at all? What do you think it is? Alright, I'm gonna tell you, there is this little sniper up here, okay, <laughs> that basically is aiming at you, right? So that's basically, it's a very difficult task, okay? Here is another one. Do you see any potential threat? Here? Well, that, okay? So there is basically a little bomb here under the car. Okay? <laughs> so basically, uh, subjects are given hundreds of these kind of scenes. Half of them have uh, a threat of this kind, a tiny little speck that could be something dangerous. And the other half instead don't have a threat. Okay? And they basically learn the task by trial and error by doing it. And they receive feedback on every trial that tells them essentially, you got it right or not. Without telling them exactly what object it is. Okay? Just yes or no. Right? So as they do the task, of course, they get better and better at, uh, at, at this classification task. And the question is, can we speed up learning, right, by using brain stimulation, okay? So the first thing we have to do is to find out where to stimulate, otherwise we don't know what to do, right? And we can do that by, um, by running a, a group of subjects, basically, in that task, and, um, and doing a brain imaging study with them, and seeing which brain areas are actually um, responding during the training, and more so for the for the threatening scene, the non the non threatening the non threatening scenes. Okay. In this case, this is a horizontal slice of the brain like this. You can see that regions in the prefrontal cortex here, especially the right one, uh, are very involved in this uh, training task. Okay. So the idea is, uh, okay, we're going to stimulate right here with electrical uh, stimulation, right, and see if we can actually improve performance in the speed wise delivery. These are the results in black are people who are receiving fake shame stimulation, so they're basically normal people just doing the task regularly. As you can see, there is a standard learning uh, improvement due to just doing the task, okay? And in white, instead, you can see that uh, the, these are the results from the second group, the group that is receiving brain stimulation. And as you can see, there's an improvement in learning, and by the end, there is about 10% increase here in the, in the accuracy of classifying these things, okay? Now, 10%, you're not really you're becoming a superhuman, okay? But nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, it can give you an advantage, especially in a situation where you have to act really fast. Okay? Also, I want to tell you that this effect does not go away as soon as you switch off the stimulator. It lasts, in this case, for at least a day. 
But I also want to point out a couple of uh, questions that are actually important here. The first one uh, is, is a limitation, right? Is uh, those these uh, apply to real world scenarios, okay? These were uh, virtual reality scenes, they were very clean. In real scenes, actually, you have lots of clutter around, okay? It's a very different kind of story. So the question is, does it apply to real world, to real scenes? The second question, which is a bit more theoretical, right, is if I train you to do well in this particular task, right? Does this have some kind of hidden cost, hidden effect on, for example, on you learning to do other tasks? Okay? We just don't know. This is completely unexplored, and that I think is a very important question for this kind of studies. The second example I want to go through very quickly is another example of learning in the field of, of language. Okay? And here a bunch of students who are trained to learn a new lexicon, okay? like totally new words, such as this nonsense word blank. And so they were associated these new words with a picture, okay? So they were given these words many, many times, these pairs. And uh, some of them were given um, stimulation of a vertical scale, which is very important for uh, language comprehension, as you know. And some of those, another group of questions was given sham stimulation. Here is what happens as they go to the train. As you can see, the sham here is uh, this, uh, this, this, dashed, this dotted line. Uh, things get a little better and better, better and better, and there is, by the end of training, there is a bit of an advantage, about 5% for the brain stimulation group, okay? So again, it's a small effect, nonetheless, you're doing a little better, okay? Also, the effect is gone after a week, when they test it, so it doesn't last, you know, more than a week. And also, we have the same question as before, does it apply to real lexical acquisition when we have hundreds or thousands of words to learn, right, with a new language? And also, very importantly, again, does this impair some other language abilities? For example, if you know a, single, a second language, do some of your members know the other language going to start getting degraded? We don't know that. Okay, I think it's a, it's a crucial question. Okay, so there are, there are actually many more examples that I have time to, to talk about of, uh, of learning in various domains that improves as a result of brain stimulation to different um, areas. Okay? And the thing I want you to, to remember here is that you don't, get any, you don't get anything for free, okay? If you just sit on your chair and get stimulated, nothing happens to you, really, okay? You have to do some work. And what happens here is that uh, you're essentially you're getting more gain for your effort, okay? Now, when we talked about the, the clinical applications, right, that was a case in which we were trying to, uh, to help somebody with, uh, with some kind of illness. And in that case, obviously, the ethical considerations are pretty clear cut. The cost-benefit ratio is typically very low because the benefits are very high. Okay? When we talk about cognitive augmentation, such as in this case, we're actually trying to improve the cognitive abilities of people who don't have a deficit. Okay? And so the ratio, the cost-benefit ratio is a bit different, and there are a bunch of ethical issues that come up. And I want to just very briefly describe a couple of them, okay? Before I'm done. So the first one is safety, obviously. When you talk about brain stimulation, the first thing that comes to mind is really how are we going to get a seizure, right? Okay? So there's been a lot of work on this, and actually, if you do uh, things the right way, there's a very small risk of seizure, right? If it's done for, in people without contraindication, for example, pacemaker or metal in the head, or if you have a history of seizures, obviously you can't use these people, right? And if it is done within the safety guidelines, okay? Both for TMS and electrical stimulation, Researchers have spent a lot of time uh, compiling very detailed tables, safety tables, to make sure that people are not in danger. <coughs> now, I think there is a second safety uh, issue here, which is not really much discussed, and it is the following one, right? Are there any adverse cognitive effects that perhaps we are not able to pick up with our tools, or perhaps we have to wait you know, some year or a few years before we can pick them up, okay? So, can brain stimulation repair desirable cognitive abilities? And I think this is pretty much unknown, and we need to do more studies on this issue. Okay? The second one is the issue of unfairness. We saw this when we were talking about uh, drugs enhancing cognition, right? Is it only for the wealthy who already have everything, right? Well, I think that uh, in this case, especially for electrical stimulation, this is not much of a problem, I think, because there are already some companies online that sell these devices, right? These are pretty safe to use, actually, if you, do, if you, if you use them properly. But as you can see, the price is very low. Okay? So if this kind of techniques end up uh, uh, working really, I think that uh, access is not going to be very difficult for people without much money. This is 
ratio, the ratio of character is a bit, a bit fuzzier, and uh, basically that's the idea that working hard to achieve something builds character. Okay? So essentially when we, uh, when we learn a skill, right, in the process of learning, we also learn a lot of uh, um, kind of life important uh, lessons, okay, and which are part of learning the skill. Okay? And so is this a problem? I think this is not much of a problem given what I told you about uh, the application to learning because, as I, as I say, brain stimulation helps those who help themselves. You have to be doing something, you have to put in some effort basically to, uh, to get some benefit, really. And then there is the issue of autonomy, which I think is critical here, and uh, basically the issue of, of coercion, right? Which is especially true for vulnerable population, vulnerable populations. Okay, we saw our soldiers. Okay, I mean, our soldiers will be required to do this to perform appropriately, or otherwise they're going to get fired. So, same for prisoners, right? Can we uh, kind of tweak with the brains to make them better somehow? Okay, or less dangerous? Those are all important questions. And same thing for, for children, for example. And also, there is, there is the, the more kind of subtle issue of implicit coercion. Okay, we all know that. And uh, there is a lot of demand for competitive advantage. If my uh, competitor starts using them, I, I may feel coerced to do it too. Okay? So that's another important question to remember. And finally, there is the issue uh, of uh, so called dehumanization, okay? which some people say basically that uh, uh, stimulation and also drug enhancing, uh, uh, and so co commission enhancing drugs are just basically supporting the view that we're just performance machines, okay? which is really a very narrow view of, of what humans are. So again, this one is another thing to keep in mind. So in sum, uh, I just basically told you that non-invasive brain stimulation is still in its infancy, especially for applications to cognition. I think there are clear benefits for basic science, understanding how our brain works, but I believe also that the size and the usefulness of the facts for clinical and cognitive augmentation applications has been hyped by the media. Okay? Basically, we need much more research, and I think also that there is, much, there is a lot of need for um, exploring these ethical issues, especially the issue of, of coercion. Thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah, that was a very balanced talk. I think notice, I said I'm not going to rush out the Bible immediately. I go into it. I'm not quite sure where we should be standing on this. I don't know how other people feel about it. I shall ask the ALT who's going to uh, think of Bible. But um, we're, we're now going to take another perspective. I'm going to ask Stephen you now to talk us through the medical implications of brain stimulation to see if he can convince us that we all ought to be going down this particular route. So, Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. That was a, that was a great introduction. It made job much, much easier. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to be back. Thank you for the, the invitation. Um, and, and back to stay, which is, uh, which is very nice because the sun's shining. Um, what I'd like to do is to, uh, to try and give a, a perspective on this which starts to, to include some of the, the medical implications, applications, if you like. When I was trying to, uh, to figure out how, um, how I should start this talk, it was about a month ago, and uh, I was uh, I foolishly signed up for something called Tough Mother, which is this uh, 12 mile run, uh, or in my case, a 6 mile jog followed by a 6 mile limb which is sort of punctuated by uh, about 20 odd obstacles and one of those obstacles they'd, uh, was called shock treatment or shock therapy or something like that and it was basically this frame that you can see on the right hand side here um, which, uh, from which uh, a load of uh, wires uh, are hung and uh, they tell you they're going to give you electric shocks and running up to this as a neuroscientist I was thinking there's no way they're going to give you dangerous uh, shocks and so if I tell you that the idea for this came to me uh, from uh, a flash of blinding light and waking up in a muddy puddle. <laughs> so I thought um, I probably shouldn't start by encouraging you to go out and uh, find something to stimulate your brains with, because as you can see, it's not generally a good idea, there's some kind of specificity that should be included in this. 
Um, so where on earth did we get this idea that using electricity uh, to stimulate our brains might be of some use? Um, if, you're, if you're of a nervous disposition or if, um, uh, if you're a bit squeamish, then this is, a, this is basically um, a, a video of early electroconvulsive therapy. And the idea for this came because in about the 1930s, the idea was that schizophrenia or mania or whatever they were referred to at the time was an opposite, an antagonistic disorder to, um, to epilepsy. And so, um, by reasoning, the idea was that if you could induce a seizure, which is um, a characteristic of epilepsy, then this would move you away from uh, schizophrenic symptoms. So, um, look away for a bit, um, for a bit squeamish. So this is an electric shock to the frontal lobe, very high current. And what's happening is that that is then inducing electrical activity, which is then propagating across the brain and then reaching the motor centers when we have this convulsive activity. And the idea was that over a long period of time, this would have an effect that would reduce um, schizophrenic tendencies or schizophrenic symptoms. We look on this now, and most people think this is, is very barbaric, but it might surprise some of you at least to know that this is still a technique which is used. So this is the same thing in modern day. This is the, uh, the electrical current being induced, um, but this person is sedated, they're anesthetized, apart from their hand, at which we can, uh, we can monitor the, uh, the seizure activity. And it's used today for um, the, uh, the treatment of depression when drugs are are effective, essentially. So looking at the science of this, do we know anything about why it's working? And the answer is generally no. There are, there are at least 50 different theories, that, uh, there were at least 50 theories back in 1950, so there are many more now. We have some ideas and uh, these theories come under different headings, there's overlap between them. Psychological theories of uh, fear, of uh, regression, uh, moving back to an earlier stage, punishment theories, amnesic theories, so uh, impairment of memory, um, neuronal loss, neuronal growth. Neuronal growth actually has uh, quite a bit of evidence to show that that actually does happen. Changes in network activity, changes in thresholds, changes in neurotransmitters. But overall what we know is that it's not specific. It's not specific in terms of the cells that it targets, or the, the brain region that it targets, or the activity that it tries to mimic. It's not trying to mimic any activity, it's a fairly one at all. So, in terms of trying to relate this to what we're using in uh, the techniques that we're showing, uh, how does it relate? So, firstly, we are, we're hoping that we're getting a lot more specificity, as Giorgio says, we're trying to target specific brain regions in the first place. Then the average is the size of the current that we're inducing. So in ECT it's about around about an amp or just under. Um, and uh, electrical stimulation test it's about 10,000 times smaller than that. Deep brain stimulation about 100,000 times smaller. And TMS about a million times smaller. And the reason why this is possible is because we're actually acting on specific subsets of neurons, specific parts of your brain to, to these activities. And so, uh, I'm repeating myself here if you were in my last core talk, but it's important to understand how the brain is made up. It's effectively made up of neurons that are clustered into communities, and these into larger communities that make up the brain regions responsible for your, your vision, for uh, your movement, for hearing, and the integration, the communication between these different networks is what's responsible for your experience, for your life. What we do know is that these communities, these populations, they oscillate, they, they have uh, particular rhythms to their firing. And so, um, I'll, I'll do the same thing as I did last time. So imagine that you are a population of neurons, and uh, give me a round of applause. Right, so we're good for the episode. So now imagine your neurons, and follow me. Brain rhythm that we can then measure. And 
and uh, I'm going up through the different speeds of road rhythms through delta, theta, alpha, beta, and each of these different rhythms has a specific, well not specific function, but they're related to a certain function. So we know that slower rhythms are, are measured during sleep, and the faster rhythms, beta and gamma, tend to be associated with function and uh, cognitive processes. Okay. So when we're giving ECT, this is a very abnormal thing for us to do, because what we're doing is we're delivering such a large current that we're getting you all to clap and just stay on. And neurons just staying on is not a, a normal condition to be in. What we're trying to do with these, uh, these more refined techniques is to, rather than get these neurons to, to fire and just stay on, is to either entrain them or just encourage them to, do, uh, to fire in a particular way. So uh, we're not just getting them to, to fire at one point in time to stay on, we're getting them to fire at a particular rhythm or encourage them to fire more readily than they would. So, deep brain stimulation, in a very similar way, this goes back a, a long way. So, in, uh, in the 18, 1860s, um, Dr. Duchenne was using deep brain stimulation in a, a slightly less refined way to, to modern times, but effectively, effectively the same thing. There we go. And the only difference between these two things is uh, surgical practice and the uh, refinement of the uh, of the the approach, so I'm struggling with the mouse. So the, um, the technique here is putting an electrode into the brain, and this is in a Parkinson's patient. We know that in Parkinson's disease, certain parts of the brain, deep brain structures, there's a lot of neurons. And what we're trying to do is to compensate for the activity that occurs because of that loss of neurons. What we tend to find is that that beta rhythm that I showed you before tends to be augmented, tends to be enhanced. And what we do is we put in a very fast uh, stimulation about 125 times per second and that seems to ablate this beta rhythm and has an improvement in function. I can show you that here. So this is uh, a patient before the brain stimulator uh, is turned on. This is very characteristic of Parkinson. So you have this tremor, this uncontrolled movement, uh, you have a rigidity and a shuffling, so this bradykinesia, a slowness of movement, difficulty in turning. Uh, poor balance and, and unsteadiness because of that. And then at the next stages, uh, there could be a, a freezing, there could be a, a, an ankinesia, an inability to actually start moving in the first place. So if I show you when the stimulator is then turned on, the same patient doesn't have the same tremor, um, doesn't have the same rigidity, has a freeness of movement, is able to turn, which is one of the major difficulties. And this is because we've put in this specific frequency of stimulation. What we're able to do is actually to tweak this with each patient so we can start off at 100 hertz, 100 times per second, and just tweak it up until we have this optimal improvement in tremor or rigidity or, or freedom of movement. The thing is, this is invasive and it's, uh, it's very attractive and it's increasingly used for Parkinson's patients and other uh, neurological disorders. But what we'd like to do is to try and have something which is a little bit less invasive. And these are the two setups that we have here. So on the left, you have uh, single shot stimulation. This is TMS, so the kit that we have here. And on the right, you have repetitive stimulation. So the left machine will do one uh, stimulation and has a period of time before it can deliver another one. On the right, we can deliver a train of different stimuli. Okay. So how is this useful? Okay, so if I go over to my... Um, I'll oh, just speak a little bit louder. So what I've got on the screen here is uh, an example of uh, a use for this in the clinic, and that is to identify what we call eloquent cortex. And the red lump that you can see here, the red mass, is a tumour in a patient, and the, this patient's going to go in for surgery. <coughs> what we want to know is that because this tumour is near to the motor cortex, we want to know that we're not going to remove anything that we shouldn't remove because if we remove it, then they're going to lose function. So, what we're effectively doing, turn this up to a look. Okay. So, what we're effectively doing is uh, stimulating and seeing if we get uh, a movement, or in fact, we don't even need to get a movement, we can put electrodes on in various parts of the body and see whether we can uh, get uh, a response. And we know that if we're getting a response, that that part of the, the brain is doing something which is still functional. Okay, so see if we can do that. What I'm going to 
I'm going to do is just put this over in my mobile cortex. I'm hoping it's on my mobile cortex. Um, <laughs> So I'm giving you a wave. And all I'm doing here is I'm, I'm hitting my hand area. This is the area that controls me with my hand. Right. And I'm fairly confident I'm going to hit my hand area because, because we are uh, manual beings, we do a lot with our hands. There's a high, lot, high representation, there's a large representation of my hand area in my brain. So uh, we've done this a few times, I'm fairly confident of being able to find out where my if I hit my leg area, then I'd probably be uh, waving to the floor. <laughs> but if we can identify, and that's where these red dots are, if we can identify which parts of the brain are still functioning, then we know that if, if possible, then we're going to avoid removing these parts of the brain. Then we've got things like rehabilitation. So on the left hand side here, you've got uh, an MRI of a patient that's had a stroke. And you can see on the left hand side of their brain, that they've had a, a massive loss of tissue um, in the temporoparietal area. Um, I'll try and show you here. This is a PhD student of mine. She's just giving a talk. I've, uh, I've muted her so that I can talk over her. Um, point. So what you can see is a patient who's had a stroke on one side, and you can see that the, the hand that relates to that impaired side is very much slower. So their right hand on the left hand side for you, very much slower than the unimpaired side. Now, that might seem like a very simple thing, but one of the things about this is that um, it's not just that impairment on the, impairment on the impacted side. It's what happens on the good side that's important as well. And what we're beginning to understand is that there's a compensatory activity, there's an overcompensation, if you like, on the good side. And that's not necessarily a good thing because it's impairing the uh, reorganisation for that impaired side. And so what we'd like to do is to, as well as enhancing the good side, we'd like to try and suppress the bad side. Or, sorry, scratch that, reverse it. So, as well as enhancing the bad side, we'd like to compare the good side, if you like. And that's why we can start to use things like this impairment approach to improve function on, uh, on our impaired side. So, um, so okay, so this is just an extension of what I was doing here. Is easy. Ready? Yeah, just go on right. Okay, so it's it's enhanced. It's worked. So the point would have been really good in writing, of course. Well, it's completely impossible. When it's you completely it. impossible. It's very, very odd when you lose one trick. Okay, so when you're trying to, when, when you're writing you a, a certain subset of you want to try and engage a task. Right. So, so in this case, we're going to try and engage a task. Very easy without stimulation. Uh, yeah. But then he retrieves this set of neurons, and what he tries to do is even more of it. Right. It's kind of to complete that task because you've got this right. of right. you've tried to right. engage right. right. or interfere with that. What we've effectively done is to reset that program. Excellent. Yeah, So, one of the things about this though is that stop doing the stimulation and the effect stops. That's not much good for us in terms of rehabilitation. So what we're trying to do is to um, find something which is a little bit longer lasting. And so the reverse is actually true in many cases. The, the problem with electricity is that it's bad for you if you happen to run into something which then shocks you and you fall down in a face full of muddy water. But, if we're trying to stimulate in a way that has an, a particular effect and then have a, a longer lasting effect, that's actually very difficult to do. It's, it's very difficult to stimulate the brain and, and, and have that effect um, last longer than just a few minutes. Um, and this is because the, the brain is a very robust machine. Um, you see the guy that's, that's running and it's actually, that wasn't me doing the running, I just looked a lot like that when I, I did that. Um, you can see that he's completely switched off, he falls down, he gets up and, and instantly that his brain is back where it was before. It takes a few minutes to figure out why you're face down a puddle of muddy water, but actually you, you're up and you're cooking. So we're trying to develop techniques that can give us some longevity. And this is something which we've done, so this is called theta burst stimulation. It's actually just a, a fast stimulation that we can put on for about 40 seconds. And what we found is that uh, it has an effect for up to about an hour. And this is one of the things which uh, is starting to be 
we looked at, and it's a, a, a much more uh, physiologically relevant uh, stimulation. What you can see is in the top right hand corner here, so the top left is just the schematic of the stimulation. It's some person sat in a chair instead of standing in front of you being stimulated. The top right hand side here, you've got uh, the effect of the, uh, the stimulation. So this is before stimulation. Just look at the red line, these are responders. And I won't go into the fact that there are respondent participants and non responders. Some people who do and some people don't respond. Just look at the, the red line. And this is showing you that uh, after stimulation, there is a reduction in the excitability in the output of this person's motor cortex. So, what that's saying is it would take a lot more juice to get that hand wave following the stimulation for a period of up to an hour. And the same is true for things like reaction time. We can impair this person's reaction time, we can increase the latency, so it takes them longer to respond. And so we can impair this person. And this is what's being used in stroke rehabilitation. Uh, it's one of the things that's being used. The, the other question is also true, then, just to go into the last part, which is that if we can impair function, um, and, and George has introduced this brilliantly, can we improve function? And the answer with this approach is, is yes, although I would just say that it's, it's subtle, it looks brilliant on this graph. But bottom right hand corner here is, if I get my cursor up, uh, so this is the stimulation that I've shown you at the top there. We have this reduction. Uh, this is one which uh, doesn't seem to have any effect. And this is an intermediate uh, version, intermediate beta burst stimulation. And this seems to enhance, so this improves the improve, increased the excitability and uh, seems to improve the reaction time for, for people that, that are taking part. So just to go on lastly to uh, the direct electrical stimulation, so the, uh, the, the newer version of, of uh, what we were talking about before. And these are much smaller currents, so uh, yeah, 10,000 times smaller than the, uh, the, uh, the convulsive therapy. And what, what I'm going to show you here is that, uh, as I've said, we're, we've got our motor cortex, and as you've probably seen, I've stimulated this side of my brain and this hand is responding. We have a what we call a contralateral uh, system where the left hand side of my brain controls the right hand side of my body, so for you. And so uh, if we look at what's going on in the motor cortex, in the hand area, we see that we have this beta rhythm, that rhythm that's, uh, that I showed you earlier on. That's, that's an ongoing uh, activity of the neurons that are in that part of the brain. If we look bottom left hand corner, bottom left hand corner down here, this is the ongoing activity. This is this beta activity that's happening in you right now. So when you're at rest, or if you're even if you're holding something, uh, this is what's going on. Okay, so this is what's going on. When you go to make a movement, this is this period here, it's around zero. You have a desynchronization, you have a switching off of this beta rhythm. So it turns off, and what we see is we have a, an increase in much faster rhythm. So basically, what that's saying is that those neurons that are in your motor area. They're at 20 times a second, they're firing whilst you're at rest. When you go to make a movement, they jump up to about seven, between 70 and 90 times a second, and then afterwards back down to, to 30 times a second. And so the idea here is uh, that, that this um, paper has looked at is that if uh, 20 hertz is to do with a hold phase, then if we stimulate at 20 hertz, will that promote a uh, hold? Will that stop you from moving quite as quickly or with quite as much force? And then conversely, if we stimulate at the faster frequency, can we induce the brain, can we, can we try to push it into a phase where it will move a bit faster with a bit more force? And that's what these dots are showing here. So in the bottom right hand corner, you've got these blue dots are showing when you stimulate at 20 hertz at this beta frequency, you're promoting this hold phase, you're promoting somebody not to move. When you stimulate a little bit faster at the 70 hertz, you're increasing the force that, or the, the speed at which people can elicit force during movement. So the idea is that uh, in the paper this is actually a subtle effect but significant that if you stimulate at a certain frequency at a certain rhythm then you can get the brain, you get the person to do something which is associated with that rhythm. Okay. And uh, just some uh, final food for thought. So the idea of, it, of uh, stimulation for treatment, I think uh, DBS is, is proven, uh, RT, RTMS works but it's is short lasting and that probably has to do with the fact that Actually, even looking at the, the rhythms that I'm talking about, that's a, a big oversimplification of how the brain works. It's just a starting point. Um, great potential for diagnostics.
because uh, it's much quicker, much cheaper than sending someone to a big neuroimaging lab to, to get an overview, but we still require uh, an MRI for this and great potential for research. I won't go into that because I think uh, George has covered that very nicely. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen. Now we come to the part of the evening when we ask the audience to make comments or to ask questions of our two speakers. So who is going to kick off with our first question? We always have to agree with the first question, so come on, someone. Be great. We've got a yes at the front, Bill. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Steve. We've got a, a microphone. Oh, convenient mic. I have a question for Stephen, which is... Um, you really can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might have recorded for the film, I guess. Um, so um, the question is, um, normally if we're just sitting around doing nothing in particular, we have alpha rhythm, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And so, so what I'm wondering is, what if you do that repetitive DMS at uh, an alpha rhythm rate? I'm wondering what happens to you. Was do you experience anything in particular? I'm yeah, because so that seems to be kind of our default mode, isn't it, Alpha? So I'm well, in the visual cortex. So in the visual cortex, you've got, you're exactly right, you've got an ongoing alpha rhythm. Um, then there's, there are controversial suggestions about what this means, whether it's to do with attention, or whether it's just, as you said, just an idle mode, or whether it's both. In the motor cortex, you have both. So you have this beta rhythm, bangs along at about 20 times a second. You also have what we call a mu rhythm, which is effectively an alpha rhythm, which is 10 times a second. Um, the answer is we don't know what happens if you stimulate at, at 10 hertz. Um, and it would be a. Okay, a what we do know is if we, if we look at what's going on at that 10 hertz, 10 times a second rhythm, um, and we look at whether somebody is effective in making uh, a movement uh, or anything actually. So if you look at the visual cortex, the visual system in particular, if you look at perception, if we record the activity in that part of the brain and we then look at when there's high or low alpha, whether somebody managed to perceive something or not, we find that when there's high alpha, people didn't perceive things. So if we, if we present people in, a, uh, in an experiment, um, a series of different stimuli, the ones that they don't see tend to be preceded by high alpha. So, yeah, very sturdy question. And um, I'm going to ask Georgia also to respond to that question. Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, okay, so there are a number of theories about you know, alpha in the visual cortex. Right? Um, the old theory, the classic theory, is that alpha is really just some passive state because you're just oscillating because you're doing nothing else, right? But there is um, a lot of recent evidence that uh, indicates or suggests at least that it's actually some kind of uh, active gating state of the cortex, right? That basically is preventing a piece of the cortex to, to uh, be distracted by external stimuli, okay? And I think there is some evidence actually when you uh, stimulate that uh, around 10 hertz, right? You, um, and you do some visual attention experiment, you actually, um, you find exactly the fact that you would expect that in, the, in the any field in which you're stimulated that in, right? You, uh, people are essentially ignoring stimuli, pure stimuli, okay? So I think that's, uh, it's a very interesting idea to, to do this. So, so to, just to, to repeat what you said, so um, if you give the stimulation, they tend to do worse on the task, they ignore the stimulation. Yeah, if there is like a, a ten, standard attention task right, where you have to, to detect things. Yeah. Good, thank you. Now we have a question at the back. Tim? I have a very different question. An evolutionary approach. Why would interfering with our brain improve its function? In evolutionary terms, why aren't we operating near our maximum? Why wouldn't the idea of um, an external aid in our brain improve the learning? I'll ask George to that first. Yes, that's, uh, that's actually a question that is often asked and that I ask myself that, you know, right. So we had, uh, you know, millions of years to optimize uh, brain kind of design, right? Why isn't it doing already that, right? And I think that uh, if you think about it, right, you can also um, ask why, why didn't we develop uh, wheels, right? Okay, um, okay, to, to, for locomotion, right? 
Uh, I think that uh, um, evolution is a very clever uh, algorithm, right? a genetic algorithm, right? That can find some local minima about uh, performance and all that. But I think uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, um, that this algorithm has found perhaps a global minimum, okay? So I think that there may be uh, cases in which we can actually improve on it. That's, what, that's all I have to say, but it's speculation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I agree with um, the question, actually. <laughs> so, from a... From a general point of view, I think there's a, the, the answer I would give is there's a cost to everything. And the things that I've been talking about with, for example, the beta gamma. So if I'm holding my glass, then I've got a lot of beta. If I'm putting it in the second I'm trying to put it down, I've got a lot of gamma. If I try to promote either one of those, then I'm promoting that particular condition. So if I want to hold it better, then I'll put in some beta. If I want to put it down better, then I'll put in some gamma. It's a very simplistic uh, explanation of that. But I think the answer is that there's going to be a, there's going to be a cost to, to whatever we do. So generally, uh, from what we've got so far, I don't think it, that that's why it's, it's very marginal and improvement that we can get. Um, but I also agree with, uh, with Georgia in terms of you know the the general improvement. I think um, there are there's a reason why evolution occurred. That's selection, and perhaps we don't have the same uh, pressures for selection. Presently, to you know, to help us to improve it further. Just going, just going back to that. Um, so it struck me with your images of companies selling these products already to improve our learning, but they're not out there looking for the costs. These companies who are going to strap a brand new battery to my head are not going to be looking for the potential costs of this product. They're looking for the benefits. There may yet be. Yeah. We don't know. Is there, is the research, is there any actually looking for the costs? Yeah, okay, that's a good question, right? So, um, I think that that's one point, one additional point I wanted to make, that there may be some hidden costs, right? As I said, this is a very recent kind of application, right? So we haven't really followed people for like, you know, 10 years or something. And also, uh, we haven't really looked for, um, for this kind of uh, cost. For example, I think there is a little bit of a hint of evidence that there is actually some, some cost, right? There is one experiment from Oxford actually came out, I think, last year, where they, uh, they had people essentially learn this kind of artificial language, actually it was uh, artificial numbers, okay? That is uh, new symbols that stand for, stood for numbers, okay? So people had to learn the mapping, right? And what they found is that with uh, uh, electrical stimulation, right, to, uh, I think it was part of the context, they found an improvement in learning of these of these pairs, right? But they also found that there was a decrement in a secondary task, right? That used these same mappings in a different way. Okay. So basically, I think that it is possible that by um, essentially kind of um, hyping these uh, these learning of a particular set of materials, that you may actually be degrading some other representations or access to the same representations in different ways. I think that's actually a different rent there. Every few years we have lots of newspaper headlines about the effect of um, mobile telephones on the brains of young children and so on. I wonder if you have a view on this. Actually, I don't, I don't have a view. I just uh, I, you know, I keep reading the same headlines that you do, and uh, at times I've been reading, trying to read some of the papers, and uh, it always looks like somewhat inconclusive. Some paper says there's a risk, some paper says, so I have not really meaningful things. I can't really answer that. I was going to say I can't really answer that. I mean, um, lots of colleagues in the past have approached this from, from in vitro right the way through to uh, in vivo human studies and then strapping. Well, I'm still absolutely kind of looking at posters, but uh, no, I, I, I don't have an answer. I don't think we yet know enough about what's, uh, what's going on in terms of that kind of local activity. I think we don't need to issue that. We can answer. Thank you, so I suppose we all keep going with our mobile phone. Now, we have a question on the front, and then just the front first, and then we'll go into that. <coughs> Do you consider that there is 
any risk that uh, um, taking in theory, taking this sort of work to its ultimate conclusion, um, you might be able to have a, a whole program of um, these various stimuli being applied to human beings who would then be sort of um, automata to be used for military purposes and um, controlled remotely. What well, an excellent question. So are you going to see killer, killer humans be stimulated um, you know, by the way of the actual etc. Yes, very good question. It's a very good question and I think it's um, well, first of all, I want to say that um, all the stuff I talked about, that um, all, the, all the training with those uh, scenes, right, that have uh, threatening scenes as non threatening, that's all was all funded by um, some branches of the military in the US, okay? And all the stuff I talked about is stuff that um, we can talk about. Who knows how much of this stuff is going on that is classified, okay? So we don't really know about those programs, okay? Nobody knows, okay? And the other thing I want to mention is that um, they um, basically creating, you know, super soldiers is a little bit of the holy grail of the military. That's, that's always what they're trying to do, okay? So every time they, there is a new drug or a new system that could give some little bit of performance boost to US soldiers, right? They're going to go for it, okay? Now, you're asking basically, is it possible that perhaps the military somehow can, um, you know, do something to soldiers' brains so that they're more motivated, perhaps, to be, um, to be, um, to do their mission. Is that what you're asking on this? Or? No, I mean controlled without any um, will of their own. You know, so they become weapons. <laughs> you mean after after they join the army or before? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I mean here I'm just speculating, right? but basically I feel like you know after you join the army, there is like an entire system that is going to try to keep you locked. Locked in, okay? There's like a culture there that is going to try to, um, you know, you're going to be essentially become part of a team, okay? So I don't think they need any brain implant or stimulation to be, to, you know, to, be, to stay in the army, okay? If you're asking, you know, before you know, going to the army, um, I have an idea. I mean, that would just be very surprised if there was a program of that sort, right? There is definitely, I think it's probably easier to do that by means of, of cool ads and video games to convince people to go into the army rather than doing something to, to the great right? But I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty confident that, you know, if, uh, if they could, they probably would. That's my, my idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the question is, will we be seeing automata who are controlled by uh, buttons being pressed by military generals sitting in rooms and turning the soldiers into killing machines? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, is it possible? Yes, I mean, absolutely. Uh, the, from a technical perspective, you have to know what the code of the brain is, and then you have to be able to replicate it, you have to be able to interfere with it. Those are very difficult things. So what we know so far from, uh, from 100 years of electrophysiology that we've got something that goes 10 times a second in the back of the brain, and something that goes 10 and 20 times a second in the middle of the brain. What we know is that that's a, that's a million years away from understanding exactly what it is that controls how. I mean, what I did was I went to make a movement uh, over there and zap my brain at that point and managed to stop that from happening. That's a long way away from actually understanding what exactly that code is that generated uh, that movement in the first place. But if we could understand exactly what that was, we could understand the, the kind of physical properties of uh, what was happening in there. Then we have the problem of managing to regenerate that to, to actually have a system like this which is fine enough to, to be able to replicate it to get those neurons to be able to do it. Um, and the, the answer to that is that although we, we know that these populations of neurons in a certain area of the brain are all going on at a certain frequency, they all have an individual job. And so we have to get to the level where we could make those neurons perform those individual jobs and that's a very difficult thing to do because we'd have to be getting down to um, a micron level, so down to very, very much smaller than millimeters in terms of these machines. But but in terms of the theory, yeah, absolutely possible. When will that happen? Well that happen. I'm busy this year. Kill <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, not just yet. We've got a question question I think at the back, is that right? Yes. Okay. 
that is a question more on the social side of the uh, transcranial uh, during the current uh, stimulation. Uh, basically, uh, I just finished um, a master's in robotics, right? And the most surprising thing I discovered this year is that there's a whole community of uh, robotics that because um, robotics components are so cheap right now, okay, are doing basically research on their own, like private research, okay? And uh, I myself was about last year to build one of the uh, devices frying the brain, right? And it's very easy, the schematics on the internet. So the question I want to ask is, are there uh, um, out there communities uh, trying to, to investigate the um, uh, the transcranial direct current stimulation uh, in, um, because I, I guess there is a pool of uh, there's a pool of people that potentially get, can give a you know direction to scientific research. They can't do scientific research on their own because of course, but they can give insight to their research. So there is a pool of communities or something. Okay. So first of all, pass this over to and then to. Yes, yeah, so the answer is it's a, it's a really big emerging area, particularly in the last two or three years, I think. So, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation and alternating current stimulation. The, the difference between the two is that one's a, a switch which we, we put on. It's, uh, uh, what it's really doing is it's changing the threshold of those populations of neurons and it's making them ready to fire. So um, we did that hand clapping earlier on. The, the analogy for that is that instead of starting from here with our hand clap, we're, we're starting here. So they're much ready to fire, you'll be able to uh, get that clap much quicker. Um, the difference from that to the alternating current is that it changes over time. And so we're able to put in a profile of, of an oscillation of a brain rhythm. And so what we're doing, instead of switching them all on or doing it constantly, we're encouraging them to follow that rhythm that we put in. That's the difference. So um, I think there's a lot of exciting research that's. Um, I think it's exciting because I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of exciting research in that area. I think that the next step is to. Um, we're, we're far away from all the Thompsons, but I think the idea is that we're trying to understand not just the rhythms, but the, the next stage beyond that. Um, we know that. Uh, a certain area of the brain won't just uh, go at a certain pace, but it will change its pace over time. And we know that that's particularly important because if uh, in Parkinson's, another characteristic of that motor area, not just that it goes at 20 hertz, but it, go, it goes at exactly 20 hertz, or, or if it's at 21 hertz, it stays there all day long. Whereas in you and I, it goes between sort of 15 and it meanders up to 30 and back down again. And that's, that's important, you can speculate on why that is probably because it needs to communicate with other areas and that movement in terms of its pace probably has something to do with being able to integrate activity or communicate with certain areas and if it just stays at one speed then it's sort of locked off from communicating so yeah okay Georgia. yes okay so i think that um, with regard to kind of uh, social networking and this i think there are actually in the internet a number of of, um, of little um, Social networks that are interested in uh, TDCS, okay. And if you look, there is one that is uh, on the site called uh, TDCS DIY, for example. Another one that is uh, there's a site called I think, uh, GoFlow that they even have uh, some schematics of the of the of basic series of that, you know. But you, all, you you just have to basically if you just go to YouTube, you find you know probably tens at least of uh, other clips of just you know regular guys who say I built this little thing. And now I'm trying to learn German. Now I'm trying to do this or that. Okay, it's I think and at this level it's it's, uh, it's pretty it's pretty uh, useless because they um, they're just you know trying random locations for a couple of days. Oh, doesn't do anything with it, right? So remember that it's uh, this kind of studies, right? Are uh, are very difficult to do in the sense that to do a good study you always have to have a, a good control condition, right? Because otherwise you have all these placebo effects, right? You know the placebo stuff, right? So you always have to have like a control condition, and the subject has to be blind to whether it is to whether he or she is in the control condition or the simulation condition. Okay? So it's, it's very difficult to, to do these experiments. But um, the answer to the question where you ask me, can we somehow leverage all these people who are interested in, 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 in TBCS to perhaps get some data? Um, I haven't really thought about that. You know, it's like uh, can we have like a uh, let the Amazon um, you know, how is it called? The, the Turk thing we got? The, the automatic Turk? The one in. Uh, what is it called? 
a mechanical turk, right? Can we all like a mechanical turk for TBCX, where they essentially harvest data from, from a number of people who do this experiments? I have no idea, we haven't talked about that. We have time, well, we've got two more questions, and then that, so we'll come back, and then we say we'll leave the I did wonder if the last chat was going to anticipate my question, which was about um, people using uh, TMS and that sort of thing for recreational purposes. Uh, I have heard that it's, uh, it can be quite pleasurable, and I was thinking particularly about this idea of neural coherence. So there are obviously lots of ways we can entrain uh, neural oscillations, and I'm particularly interested in speech. There's a lot of uh, work at the moment showing that uh, theta rhythms seem to entrain to the flow of syllables in speech. So it's about the same sort of rate, about five hertz, about five syllables a second, and we get the same sort of flow of these rhythms. And of course, when you go look at the, the, the actual uh, brain waves here, as speech itself, it's incredibly aperiodic. It's not actually, you expect to see like regular waves, and it never is like that. But there's an argument in the speech community that if we listen to very regular periodic speech, such as it rarely is, or for instance a, child, a, a mother comforting a child, or maybe some musical speech or chant, then we can achieve a, a more, neuro, more regular neural coherence. So five words where it's actually sort of one syllable every two milliseconds, and we have brain waves in training with that. So thinking more broadly, is it the case that uh, you can achieve regular uh, neural oscillations with uh, with electrical stimulation and do regular the more regular the oscillation the more sense of sort of well-being or, or um, happiness or whatever you can induce. Okay. So the question is about recreational use and we have fairly short answers because we're running short of time and we've got one more. Yeah, well, I'm not an expert in skill, right? but um, uh, there are phenomena like uh, in training where you can actually um, essentially sync some of these uh, uh, some of these oscillations to some external stimulation, right? And I'm not sure if there are any studies showing that uh, asking people to, to tell how well they feel when they, how well they feel when they actually they're, they're like um, really synchronous oscillations or not. Perhaps Stephen knows. Recreational, yes or no? Uh, you don't, I don't think you necessarily need the, the brain stimulation that is the answer, or at least not from an electrical. Um, a colleague of mine was doing uh, a study uh, looking at the electrical activity, looking at the oscillations with didgeridoos. She had a, I think she published a paper on didgeridoos and didgeridoos. So <laughs> and, uh, and the idea was, is there any training to those specific frequencies because uh, the didgeridoo uh, listens a specific frequency in the brain, so I think that. I can't remember the, uh, the results of that. Thank you. So, if you don't try a cranial stimulation, try a didgeridoo instead. Okay, we have um, one final question from just uh, down. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. But, uh, well, all right. We'll, um, you, seeing as the last one, we'll have one more after the last one. Right? <laughs> Has this method been used for treating drug addictions or obsessive compulsive disorders? Could you repeat that? Has this method been used for treating drug addictions? Oh, drug addiction, okay. Has it been used for treating drug addictions? Any, any... I, I don't know is, is the answer. I mean, I can see the, can see the potential for it, particularly as you can see the competitive spot. I don't know. So <coughs> Well, I don't know about drug addiction itself, but uh, it has been used in the field of, of, um, of craving reduction, for example, in uh, cigarette smokers. There, there is some evidence that you can actually um, reduce the cravings, okay, which may be helpful for, for um, um, improving it, for basically the addiction. And we have one really final question. Thanks very much. Just thinking about spinal cord injuries, I was wondering, can you stimulate the motor neurons of the spinal cord in the same way? And could that potentially be used to bridge? Section. There's, uh, yeah, there's some really interesting studies right back to the, uh, to the beginning of uh, some great neuroscience which looks at what happens when you set up connections between uh, muscles and the brain and what we find is in both areas you get these, uh, these specific changes which, uh, changes which occur. Um, 
that I, I don't know of anything which has been done specifically on spot on spot. You can try that on yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, back to Lawrence's question before. Uh, yeah, don't, don't sit in your office and stimulate yourself. Recollect <laughs> 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 there's, there's some, some studies um, a, a little while ago that, that showed that uh, the primates, if they stimulate the frontal lobe, and will um, find a, a sweet spot, then they'll, they'll do it until they, they finish themselves, so to speak. Well, let me just say, I'm so <laughs> who is going to go for some form of electrical stimulation after this talk? <laughs> <laughs> who feels that they'll stick to the teachery to instead? <laughs> okay, well, it's been a fascinating evening. Big thank you to both our speakers, and a big thank you to the audience for your participation and for coming to these cultures. We start again in the autumn. Thank you and good night. <laughs>